Coleman, Zoom, Strip Coverlet, Ich heiße Adrian Fort. Wie heißt du? And now that I am through with awkward beginnings, let's get right into things. We are here for part two of Leonardo da Vinci, Flights of the Mind, a biography by Charles Nicole. This is part two of what will inevitably be a 3,491 part series, uh, but it will hopefully be a good series as I have wanted to read this biography for quite some time. I bought it years ago, uh, and this is on part one, Childhood, the subchapter titled Birth. Uh, now immediately, a lot of energy is expended in this chapter explaining that uh, the da Vinci family was not rich, but certainly they were not poor. Uh, they had settled into the trade of being notaries, which was an extremely important, if not prestigious, job uh, and post during, uh, due to the growing, pardon me, the growing middle and merchant classes of the time and area. We also learn that uh, Leonardo's mother was named Caterina, and because not much is known about her, there is much conjecture about her relationship with Leonardo's father. But we get this quote from Leonardo, which is and which should be fairly telling about that relationship. Leonardo says in one of his folios, "The man who has intercourse aggressively and uneasily will produce children who are irritable and untrustworthy. But if the intercourse is done with great love and desire on both sides, then the child will be of great intellect and witty, lively and lovable." When we take into account Leonardo's opinion of himself, we can probably draw some fairly safe conclusions about the type of feelings that his parents fostered for one another despite the fact that their love was uh, forbidden due to the fact that Caterina was not of Piero's social status, Piero being Leonardo's father. Um, and I think that one thing that is also interesting to uh, observe from that quote is the fact that as opposed to a person's temperament being a product of their life after conception, Leonardo, who was a very scientifically minded person of his time, figured that there was something to do with the process of that conception that ultimately went into shaping the individual that would be. Uh, and I think that's just something that is interesting to observe, especially considering the way that, that we look at things today. On page 25, we get this quote of Leonardo's father. It is certainly true that he left nothing to Leonardo in his will. He had numerous legitimate children by then, but to leave him nothing is surely significant. Uh, how do you how do we weigh things such as this observation such as this facts such as this the important thing i think to remember about biographies is that they take into account a time frame not a moment uh, and our feelings towards people are fluid they change as we go on right there is time between the quote and the fact there is time between leonardo and piero being individuals being their own men and Piero leaving Leonardo nothing in his will. Uh, this is just conjecture for me at this point because I don't know the timeline of things, but it is possible perhaps that by this time Leonardo had made himself to some degree and was not needing of anything from Piero by the time he passed and the things that P Piero left behind um, would better serve his legitimate children than Leonardo especially because Leonardo seemed to be such an eclectic individual. It's the conundrum, what do you buy the man who has everything? What do you buy the man who is so eclectic? What do you buy the man who is like Leonardo? Just such a strange individual. Uh, but I think that the most important talking fact, talking point here is something that is um, introduced very early in the fact in the chapter, and that's that Leonardo was a bastard that Leonardo was an illegitimate child. This is probably not surprising to anyone who has even a passing or cursory interest in Leonardo, as it's something that as soon as you dig below the surface level, as soon as you learn something about Leonardo, despite or beyond the fact that he was a painter, you learn this. And it's something that in fact, you're, you're 
kind of tired of hearing about. But I really do think that it is important to understanding the massive nature of Leonardo's influence. To be an illegitimate child, to be an illegitimate child was to be automatically worth less than the next individual. Without question. Now, hate and discrimination are, it seems, inherent to the human experience, right? We have to have someone to hate, we have to have someone to discriminate. And unless I am misunderstanding the area in which he lived, northern Italy at this point in the mid 1400s would have been a fairly homogenous place. So there was a lot of excess hatred and discrimination to be spread, right? Someone had to be, someone had to be taking the brunt of this. Illegitimate children were, were people who, uh, yeah, it's okay to hate them. Yeah, it's okay to say that they are worth less. Yeah, it's okay to discriminate those people. Well, Leonardo was also a prick, like all of the best artists, by the way. So what's the math on this? Tell a prick that he is subhuman, and all he has to do is prove that he is better than you, and it will shut you the hell up. Why? Because if Leonardo is subhuman because he is an illegitimate child, and Leonardo is smarter than you, well, what does that make you? Right? So that little bit of prickitude is something that L Leonardo certainly would have developed because of this and definitely used to his advantage. And that chip on his shoulder of being automatically worth less than the next individual uh, led him to working tirelessly. He became intelligent and he became fierce and he broke the rules just daring someone to say something, daring people to say anything. Why? Because as soon as you throw that barb, I'm going to cut you down at the knees. And if I am, if I am subhuman and I've cut you down at the knees, what are you? Again, and this is the fierceness. This is the daring with which uh, we see everything spring forth from the character, which is Leonardo. Uh, this is this is the guy that um, there is a there is a legend, perhaps. It is just a legend, I am not sure, but Verrocchio, the guy under which Leonardo studied. Uh, one of the things that you did at this time was the master kind of did some of his painting and then he said, hey, you, come here. I want you to do this little detail over here. Well, one of the stories about Leonardo is Verrocchio was making a painting and <clears throat> he told two of his artists, I want you to draw these uh, shrubs over here his little angels or something. I can't remember exactly what it was. The one artist did his, and then Leonardo came over and Leonardo did his. And at that point, at that point that Leonardo finished his little detail on Verrocchio's painting, Verrocchio looked at it and said, well, I'm done. I retire. Uh, the student is better than the master. There is nothing left for me to prove. Uh, the, 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 the climax of my life as a painter is this guy right here, so I don't have to paint anymore. And the legend says that at that point, uh, Verrocchio never touched a paintbrush again. So that is, that goes back to that little chip on his shoulder that says, you know what, that's fine. Say what you will, but I am going to be better than you. So even these little details that he was commissioned to do on someone else's painting, he looked at and said, this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity to take things and run and prove not only yourself, but prove against other people. Uh, that is a legend that did not happen in this uh, chapter here, but it's something that I've seen uh, communicated on numerous occasions. So I will be interested to see if it comes back in this biography, that little legend about um, Leonardo basically forcing Verrocchio into retirement. So that's it for this episode. Uh, if you liked what you saw, hit like and subscribe and comment in the section below whose biography we should pursue after Leonardo's. Thank you.